Chapter 1. The Return of the Seventies No Longer the Pleasures, Joy Division Adapted from K-Punk Post, January 9th, 2005 If Joy Division matter now more than ever, it's because they capture the depressed spirit of our times. Listen to Joy Division now and you have the inescapable impression that the group are catatonically channeling our present, their future. From the start, their work was overshadowed by a deep foreboding, a sense of a future foreclosed, all certainties dissolved, only growing gloom ahead. It has become increasingly clear that 1979 to 1980, the years with which the group will always be identified, was a threshold moment, the time when a whole world, social democratic, Fordist, industrial, became obsolete, and the contours of a new world, neoliberal, consumerist, informatic, began to show themselves. This is, of course, a retrospective judgment. Breaks are rarely experienced as such at the time, but the 70s exert a particular fascination now that we are locked into the new world, a world that Deluge, using a word that would become associated with joy division, called the society of control. The 70s is the time before the switch, a time at once kinder and harsher than now. Forms of social security then taken for granted have long since been destroyed, but vicious prejudices that were then freely aired have become unacceptable. The conditions that allowed a group like Joy Division to exist have evaporated, but so has a certain grey grim texture of everyday life in Britain, a country that seemed to have given up rationing only reluctantly. By the early noughties, the 70s was long enough ago to have become a period setting for drama, and Joy Division were part of the scenery. This was how they featured in Michael Winterbottom's 24-hour party people. The group were little more than a cameo here, the first chapter in the story of Factory Records and its buffoon genius impresario Tony Wilson. Joy Division assumed centre stage in Anton Corbin's control, but the film didn't really connect. For those who knew the story, it was a familiar trip. For those not already initiated, however, the film didn't do enough to convey the group's sorcerous power. We were taken through the story but never drawn into the maelstrom, never made to feel why any of it mattered. Perhaps this was inevitable. Rock depends crucially on a particular body and a particular voice and the mysterious relationship between the two. Control could never make good the loss of Ian Curtis's voice and body and so ended up as Arthouse karaoke naturalism. The actors could simulate the chords, could ape Curtis's moves, but they couldn't forge the vortical charisma, couldn't muster the unwishing necromantic art that transformed the simple musical structures into a ferocious expressionism, a portal to the outside. For that, you need the footage of the group performing, the sound of the records, which is why of the three films featuring the group, Grant Gee's 2007 documentary Joy Division, patched together from Super 8 fragments, TV appearances, new interviews and old images of post-war Manchester, was most effective at transporting us back to those disappeared times. Guy's film begins with an epigraph from Marshall Berman's All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, The Experience of Modernity. To be modern is to find ourselves in an environment that promises us adventure, power, joy, growth, transformation of ourselves and the world, and at the same time that threatens to destroy everything we have, everything we know, everything we are. Where Control tried to conjure the presence of the group but left us only with a tracing, an outline, Joy Division is organised around a vivid sense of loss. It is self-consciously a study of a time and a place, both of which are now gone. Joy Division is a roll call of disappeared places and people. So many dead already, not only Curtis, but also the group's manager Rob Gretton, their producer Martin Hannett, and of course Tony Wilson. The film's coup, its most electric moment, the sound of a dead man wandering in the land of the dead, a scratchy old cassette recording of Ian Curtis being hypnotised into a past life regression. I travelled far and wide through many different times a slow, slurred voice channeling something cold and remote. How old are you? 28. An exchange made all the more chilling because we know that Curtis would die at the age of 23. Asylums with doors open wide. I didn't hear Joy Division until 1982, so for me, Curtis was always already dead. When I first heard them, age 14, it was like that moment in John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness when Sutter Kane forces John Trent to read the novel, the hyperfiction, in which he is already immersed. My whole future life, intensely compacted into those sound images, 
Ballard, Burroughs, Dub, Disco, Gothic, Antidepressants, Psych Wards, Overdoses, Slashed Wrists. Way too much stim to even begin to assimilate. Even they didn't understand what they were doing. How on earth could I then? New Order, more than anyone else, were in flight from the mausoleum edifice of Joy Division, and they had finally achieved severance by 1990. The England World Cup song, cavorting around with Beery Leary Keith Allen, a man who, more than any other, personifies the quotidian masculinism of overground British bloke culture in the late 80s and 90s, was a consummate act of desublimation. This, in the end, was what Codwo Eshun called the price of escaping the anxiety of influence, the influence of themselves. On movement, the group were still in post-traumatic stress, frozen into a barely communicative trance. The noise that surrounds me, so loud in my head. It was clear, in the best interviews the bands ever gave, to John Savage a decade and a half after Curtis's death, that they had no idea what they were doing and no desire to learn. Of Curtis's disturbing, compelling, hypercharged stage trance spasms and of his disturbing, compelling, catatonic downer words, they said nothing and asked nothing, for fear of destroying the magic. They were unwitting necromancers who had stumbled upon a formula for channeling voices, apprentices without a sorcerer. They saw themselves as mindless golems animated by Curtis's visions. Thus, when he died, they said that they had felt they had lost their eyes. Above all, and even if only because of audience reception, they were more than a pop group, more than entertainment, that much is obvious. We know all the words as if we wrote them ourselves. We followed stray hints in the lyrics out to all sorts of darker chambers, and listening to the albums now is like putting on a comfortable and familiar set of clothes. But who is this we? Well, it might have been the last we that a whole generation of not-quite-men could feel a part of. There was an odd universality available to Joy Division's devotees, provided you were male, of course. Provided you were male, of course. The Joy Division religion was, self-consciously, a boy's thing. Deborah Curtis. Whether it was intentional or not, the wives and girlfriends had gradually been banished from all but the most local of gigs, and a curious male bonding had taken place. The boys seemed to derive their fun from each other. No girls allowed. As Curtis's wife, Deborah was barred from Rock's pleasure garden and could not pass into the cult of death that lay beyond the pleasure principle. She was just left to clear up the mess. If Joy Division were very much a boys club, their signature song, She's Lost Control, saw Ian Curtis abjecting his own disease, the holy sickness of epilepsy, onto a female other. Freud includes epileptic fits, along, incidentally, with a body in the grip of sexual passion, as examples of the unheimlich, the unhomely, the strangely familiar. Here the organic is slaved to the mechanical rhythms of the inorganic. The inanimate calls the tune, as it always does with Joy Division. She's Lost Control is one of Rock's most explicit encounters with the mineral lure of the inanimate. Joy Division's icy-spined undeath disco sounds like it has been recorded inside the damaged synaptic pathways of a brain of someone undergoing a seizure. Curtis's sepulchral anhedonic vocals sent back to him, as if they were the voice of an other, or others, in long leering expressionistic echoes that linger like acrid acid fog. She's lost control, traverses pole-like cataleptic black holes in subjectivity, takes flatline voyages into the land of the dead and back to confront the edge of no escape, seeing in seizures little deaths which offer terrifying but exhilarating releases from identity, more powerful than any orgasm. In this colony. Try to imagine England in 1979 now. Pre-VCR, pre-PC, pre-C4. Telephones far from ubiquitous, we didn't have one till around 1980, I think. The post-war consensus disintegrating on black and white TV. More than anyone else, Joy Division turned this dourness into a uniform that self-consciously signified absolute authenticity. The deliberately functional formality of their clothes seceding from punk's tribalised anti-glamour. Depressives dressing for the depression. It wasn't for nothing that they were called Warsaw when they started out. But it was in this eastern block of the mind, in this slough of despond, that you could find working class kids who wrote songs steeped in Dostoevsky, Conrad, Kafka, Burroughs, Ballard. 
kids who, without even thinking about it, were rigorous modernists who would have disdained repeating themselves, never mind disinterring and aping what had been done 20, 30 years ago. Back in 79, Art Rock still had a relationship to the sonic experimentation of the Black Atlantic. Unthinkable now, but white pop was then no stranger to the cutting edge, so a genuine trade was possible. Joy Division provided the Black Atlantic with some sonic fictions it could redeploy. Listen to Grace Jones's extraordinary cover of She's Lost Control, or Sleazy D's I've Lost Control, or even Kanye West's 808s and Heartbreak, with its sleeve reference to Savile's Blue Monday cover design and its echoes of atmosphere and In a Lonely Place. For all that, Joy Division's relationship to black pop was much more occluded than that of some of their peers. Post-punk's break from lumpen punk ore and ore consistent in large part in an ostentatiously flag return reclaiming of black pop, funk and dub especially. There was none of that, in the surface at least, with Joy Division. But a group like Public Image Limited's take on dub now sounds a little laborious, a little literal, whereas Joy Division, like The Fall, came off as a white Anglo equivalent of dub. Both Joy Division and The Fall were black in the priorities and economies of their sound, bass heavy and rhythm driven. This was dub not as a form but a methodology, a legitimation for conceiving of sound production as abstract engineering. But Joy Division also had a relationship to another super synthetic, artially artificial black sound, disco. Again, it was they, better than Public Image Limited, who delivered the death disco beat. As John Savage loves to point out, the swarming syndromes on Insight seem to be borrowed from disco records like Amy Stewart's Knock on Wood. The role in all this of Martin Hannett, a producer who needs to be counted with the very greatest in pop, cannot be underestimated. It is Hannett, alongside Peter Saville, the group's sleeve designer, who ensured that Joy Division were more art than rock. The damp mist of insinuating uneasy listening sound FX with which Hannett cloaked the mix, together with Saville's depersonalising designs, meant that the group could be approached not as an aggregation of individual expressive subjects, but as a conceptual consistency. It was Hannett and Saville who transmuted the stroppy neuromantics of Warsaw into cyberpunks. Day in, day out. Joy Division connected not just because of what they were, but when they were. Mrs Thatcher just arrived, the long grey winter of Reaganomics on the way, the Cold War still feeding our unconscious with a lifetime's worth of retina-melting nightmares. Joy Division were the sound of British culture's speed come down, a long, slow, screaming neural shutdown. Since 1956, when Eden took amphetamines throughout the Suez crisis, through the pop of the 60s, which had been kicked off by the Beatles going through the wall on uppers in Hamburg, through punk, which consumed speed like there was no tomorrow. Britain had been, in every sense, speeding. Speed is a connectivity drug, a drug that made sense in a world in which electronic connections were madly proliferating. But the come down is vicious. Massive serotonin depletion. Energy crash. Turn on your TV. Turn down your pulse. Turn away from it all. It's all getting too much. Melancholia was Curtis's art form, just as psychosis was Marky Smith's. Nothing could have been more fitting than that Unknown Pleasures began with a track called Disorder. For the key to Joy Division was the Ballardian spinal landscape, the connexus linking individual psychopathology with social anomy. The two meanings of breakdown, the two meanings of depression. That was how Sumner saw it anyhow. As he explained to Savage, there was a huge sense of community where we lived. I remember the summer holidays when I was a kid. We would stay up late and play in the street and 12 o'clock at night there would be old ladies talking to each other. I guess what happened in the 60s was that the council decided that it wasn't very healthy and something had to go. And unfortunately, it was my neighbourhood that went. We were moved over the river to a tower block. At the time I thought it was fantastic. Now of course I realise it was an absolute disaster. I'd had a number of other breaks in my life, so when people say about the darkness in Joy Division's music, by age of 22, I'd had quite a lot of loss in my life. The place where I used to live, where I'd had my happiest memories, all of that had gone. All that was left was a chemical factory. I realised then that I could never go back to that happiness. So there's this void. Dead End Lives at the End of the 70s. There were Joy Division, Curtis doing what most working class men still did, 
early marriage and a kid. Feel it closing in. Sumner again. When I left school and got a job, real life came as a terrible shock. My first job was at Salford Town Hall, sticking down envelopes, sending rates out. I was chained in this horrible office every day, every week, every year, with maybe three weeks holiday a year. The horror enveloped me, so the music of Joy Division was about the death of optimism, of youth. A requiem for doomed youth culture. Here are the young men, the weight on their shoulders, went the famous lines from decades on Closer. The titles New Dawn Fades and Unknown Pleasures could themselves be referring to the betrayed promises of youth culture. Yet what is remarkable about Joy Division is their total acquiescence in this failure, the way in which, from the start, they set up an Antarctic camp beyond the pleasure principle. Set the controls for the heart of the black sun. What impressed and perturbed about Joy Division was the fixatedness of their negativity. Unremitting wasn't the word. Yes, Lou Reed and Iggy and Morrison and Jagger had dabbled in nihilism, but even with Iggy and Reed that had been ameliorated by the odd moment of exhilaration, or at least there had been some explanation for their misery, say sexual frustration or drugs. What separated Joy Division from any of their predecessors, even the bleakest, was the lack of any apparent object cause for their melancholia. That's what made it melancholia rather than melancholy, which has always been an acceptable, subtly sublime delectation for men to relish. From its very beginnings, Robert Johnson and Sinatra, 20th century pop has been more to do with male and female sadness rather than elation. Yet, in the case of both the bluesman and the crooner, there is at least ostensibly a reason for the sorrow. Because Joy Division's bleakness was without any specific cause, they crossed the line from the blue of sadness into the black of depression, passing into the desert and wastelands where nothing brings either joy or sorrow. Zero effect. No heat in Joy Division's loins. They surveyed the troubles and the evils of this world with the uncanny detachment of the norasthenic. Curtis sang, I've lost the will to want more, on insight, but there was no sense that there had been any such will in the first place. Give their earliest songs a casual listen and you could easily mistake their tone for the curled lip of spiky punk outrage, but already it is as if Curtis is not railing against injustice or corruption so much as marshalling them as evidence for a thesis that was, even then, firmly established in his mind. Depression is, after all and above all, a theory about the world, about life. The stupidity and venality of politicians, leaders of men, the idiocy and cruelty of war, walked in line, are pointed to as exhibits in a case against the world, against life, that is so overwhelming, so general, that to appeal to any particular instance seems superfluous. In any case, Curtius expects no more of himself than he does of others. He knows he cannot condemn from a moral high ground. He let them use you for their own ends. He'll let you take his place in a showdown. This is why Joy Division can be a very dangerous drug for young men. They seem to be presenting the truth. They present themselves as doing so. Their subject, after all, is depression. Not sadness or frustration, rock standard downer states, but depression. Depression, whose difference from mere sadness consists in its claim to have uncovered the final unvarnished truth about life and desire. The depressive experiences himself as walled off from the life world, so that his own frozen inner life, or inner death, overwhelms everything. At the same time, he experiences himself as evacuated, totally denuded, a shell. There is nothing except the inside, but the inside is empty. For the depressive, the habits of the former life world now seem to be precisely a mode of play-acting, a series of pantomime gestures, a circus complete with all fools, which they are both no longer capable of performing and which they no longer wish to perform. There's no point. Everything is a sham. Depression is not a sadness, not even a state of mind. It is a neurophilosophical disposition. Beyond Pop's bipolar oscillation between evanescent thrill and frustrated hedonism, beyond Jagger's Miltonian Mephistophelianism, beyond Iggy's negated Carney, beyond Roxy's lound lizard reptilian melancholy, beyond the pleasure principle altogether, Joy Division were the most Chopin-Horian of rock groups, so much so that they barely belonged to rock at all. 
Since they had so thoroughly stripped out Rock's libidinal motor, it would be better to say that they were libidinally as well as sonically anti-Rock. Or perhaps, as they thought, they were the truth of Rock, Rock divested of all illusions. The depressive is always confident of one thing, that he is without illusions. What makes Joy Division so Schopenhauerian is the disjunction between Curtis's detachment and the urgency of the music, its implacable drive standing in for the dumb insatiability of the life will, the Beckettian I must go on, not experienced by the depressive as some redemptive positivity, but as the ultimate horror, the life will paradoxically assuming all the loathsome properties of the undead. Whatever you do, you can't extinguish it. It keeps coming back. Except like a curse, an unlucky deal. Joy Division followed Schopenhauer through the curtain of Maya, went outside Burrow's Garden of Delights and dared to examine the hideous machineries that produce the world as appearance. What did they see there? Only what all depressives, all mystics always see. The obscene undead twitching of the will as it seeks to maintain the illusion that this object, the one it is fixated upon now, this one will satisfy it in a way that all other objects thus far have failed to. Joy Division, with an ancient wisdom, Ian sounded old as if he had lived a lifetime in his youth, said Deborah Curtis, a wisdom that seems pre-mammalian, pre-multicellular life, pre-organic. This is the insight that stopped fear in Curtis, the calming despair that subdued any will to want more. Joy Division saw life as the Poe of the Conqueror Worm had seen it, as Ligotti sees it, an automated marionette dance, which, through a circle that ever re-runneth in, to the self-same spot, an ultra-determined chain of events that goes through its motions with remorseless inevitability. You watch the pre-scripted film as if from outside, condemned to watch the reels as they come to a close, brutally taking their time. A student of mine once wrote in an essay that they sympathise with Schopenhauer when their football team loses. But the true Schopenhauerian moments are those in which you achieve your goals, perhaps realise your long-cherished heart's desire, and feel cheated, empty, no more, or is it less than empty, voided. Joy Division always sounded as if they had experienced one too many of those desolating voidings, so that they could no longer be lured back onto the merry-go-round. They knew that satiation wasn't succeeded by tristesse. It was itself immediately tristesse. Satiation is the point at which you must face the existential revelation that you didn't really want what you seemed so desperate to have, that your most urgent desires are only a filthy vitalist trick to keep the show on the road. If you can't replace the fear or the thrill of the chase, why stir yourself to pursue yet another empty kill? Why carry on with the charade? Depressive ontology is dangerously seductive because, as the zombie twin of a certain philosophical wisdom, it is half true. As the depressive withdraws from the vacant confections of the life world, he unwittingly finds himself in concordance with a human condition so painstakingly diagrammed by a philosopher like Spinoza. He sees himself as a serial consumer of empty simulations, a junkie hooked on every kind of deadening high, a meat puppet of the passions. The depressive cannot even lay claim to the comforts that a paranoic can enjoy, since he cannot believe that the strings are being pulled by anyone. No flow, no connectivity in the depressive's nervous system. Watch from the wings as the scenes were replaying, go the fatalistic lines in decades, and Curtis wrote with the depressive's iron certainty about life as some pre-scripted film. His voice, from the very start terrifying in its fatalism, in its acceptance of the worst, sounds like the voice of a man who is already dead, or who has entered an appalling state of suspended animation, death within life. It sounds preternaturally ancient, a voice that cannot be sourced back to any living being, still less to a young man barely in his twenties. A loaded gun won't set you free, so you say. A loaded gun won't set you free, Curtis sang on New Dawn Fades from Unknown Pleasures, but he didn't sound convinced. After pondering over the words to New Dawn Fades, Deborah Curtis wrote, I broached the subject with Ian, trying to make him confirm that they were only lyrics and bore no resemblance to his true feelings. It was a one-sided conversation. He refused to confirm or deny any of the points raised, and he walked out of the house. I was left questioning myself instead. 
but did not feel close enough to anyone else to voice my fears. Would he really have married me knowing that he still intended to kill himself in his early twenties? Why father a child when you have no intention of being there to see it grow up? Had I been so oblivious to his unhappiness that he had been forced to write about it? The male lust for death had always been a subtext in Rock, but before Joy Division it had been smuggled into Rock under libidinous pretexts. A black dog in wolf's clothing, Thanatos cloaked as Eros, or else it had worn pantomime panstick. Suicide was a guarantee of authenticity, the most convincing of signs that you were for real. Suicide has the power to transfigure life with all its quotidian mess, its conflicts, its ambivalences, its disappointments, its unfinished business, its waste and fever and heat, into a cold myth as solid, seamless and permanent as the marble and stone that Peter Seville would simulate on the record sleeves and Curtis would caress in the lyrics to In a Lonely Place. In a Lonely Place was Curtis's song, but it was recorded by New Order in a zombie state of post-traumatic disorder after Curtis's death. It sounds like Curtis is an interloper at his own funeral, mourning his own death. How I wish you were here with me now. The great debates over Joy Division, were they fallen angels or ordinary blokes? Were they fascists? Was Curtis's suicide inevitable or preventable? All turn on the relationship between art and life. We should resist the temptation to be Lorelei lured by either the aesthete romantics, in other words us, as we were, or the lumpen empiricists. The aesthetes want the world promised by the sleeves and the sound, a pristine black and white realm unsullied by the grubby compromises and embarrassments of the everyday. The empiricists insist on just the opposite, on rooting the songs back in the quotidian at its least elevated and, most importantly, at its least serious. Ian was a laugh. The band were young lads who liked to get pissed. It was all a bit of fun that got out of hand. It's important to hold on to both of these joy divisions, the joy division of pure art and the joy division who are just a laugh, at once. For if the truth of joy division is that they were lads, then joy division must also be the truth of ladism. And so it would appear. Beneath all the red-nosed, downer-fueled jollity of the past two decades, mental illness has increased some 70% among adolescents. Suicide remains one of the most common sources of death for young males. I crept into my parents' house without waking anyone and was asleep within seconds of my head touching the pillow. The next sound I heard was, This is the end, beautiful friend. This is the end, my only friend, the end. I'll never look into your eyes again. Surprised at hearing the doors as the end, I struggled to rouse myself. Even as I slept, I knew it was an unlikely song for Radio 1 on a Sunday morning. But there was no radio, it was all a dream. Smiley's Game, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, from Film Quarterly, Volume 65, Number 2, 2011. What is the allure of George Smiley? Why does Smiley beguile even left-wing viewers who, on the face of it, might be expected to see him as at one point in John le Carre's 1974 novel, he describes himself the very archetype of a flabby Western liberal? The enigma of Smiley's appeal is one of many spectres that haunts Thomas Alfredson's movie adaptation of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. The ghost that most insistently refuses to be exorcised is the 1979 BBC TV version, rightly remembered as one of the greatest ever British television series. Readapting a novel after so accomplished a version is risky, especially when you have a mere two hours to play with, as opposed to the series' more unhurried five. Pace and pacing, as in moving around restively while waiting, were central to the coiling tension of the TV series, which caught the crab-like convolutions and slowly interlocking rhythms of Le Carre's narrative exceptionally well. The limitations of television production actually benefited the sense of expansiveness. Sets and action were minimal. The drama was often about faces, and about Alec Guinness's face in particular, which could suggest a lifetime of regret with even the slightest wince. Guinness's performance was a masterclass in concision and nuance, not words one would always associate with Gary Oldman, cast emphatically against type as Smiley in The New Tinker Tailor. When a novel creates as rich a myth world as Le Carre's does, no single adaptation will ever completely exhaust it. 
There is always the possibility of uncovering hitherto unexplored angles, and for those of us who are fans of the novel, a strong new version would have had the benefit of liberating the book, and Smiley, from the Guinness portrayal, a prospect that might explain some of Lacara's enthusiasm for the film. Lacara has said he felt that Guinness took Smiley from him, making him unable to write the character anymore. When it was announced that this was Alfredson's next directing project after the success of Let the Right One In, hopes for something special were justifiably high. His brilliant reworking of vampire fiction had a sense of melancholy, violent lives lived in secret that could have carried over most effectively to the closed world intrigues of British spying. It is thus all the more disappointing that this new Tinker Tailor fails to compellingly reimagine the story, and central to its failure is the film's inability to make Smiley alluring. In the novel, Le Carre reckoned with the sensational exposures that had both traumatised and titillated British society in the 60s, when Soviet double agents Guy Burgess, Donald MacLean and Kim Philby were revealed to be operating right at the heart of the intelligence establishment. The book begins when Smiley is called out of retirement to search for a deep cover mole. It was in fact Le Carre who popularised this term, in the Secret Intelligence Service, otherwise known as MI6. Tinker Taylor follows Smiley's circuitous pursuit and exposure of the traitor, who is ultimately revealed to be Smiley's friend and rival, Bill Hayden, one of many men to have affairs with Smiley's semi-estranged wife, Anne. The narrative is suffused with what Paul Gilroy has called post-colonial melancholia. Smiley, Hayden and their contemporaries, notably Jim Prideau, the former head of the Scalp Hunters section, shot in the bungled operation that ultimately leads to the mole being uncovered, and Connie Sachs, the head of intelligence, dismissed when she comes uncomfortably close to the truth, have watched all the expectations born of imperial privilege slowly disappearing. Trained to empire, trained to rule the waves, all gone, all taken away, Sachs laments. Post-colonial melancholia is fed more by hostility towards the US than it is by fear of the Soviets. Hayden and Smiley's boss, the irascible Control, are united in their loathing of Americans. When Control is manoeuvred out of his position by the ambitious and very pro-US Percy Alleline, this seems to consolidate the sense of irreversible decline which hangs over the novel. England's glory lies in the past, the future is American. In the novel and its sequels, it is clear that Smiley's victory is temporary. His world is on the brink of disappearing. Smiley brings to mind English archetypes both ancient and modern. What is the perpetually cuckolded Smiley returning to save his ailing kingdom if not a Cold War King Arthur? Yet this is Arthur done in the style of T.S. Eliot's Prufock, whose famous self-characterisation as an attendant lord applies all too accurately to Le Carre's character as well. Differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. While in some respects a pathologically self-blinding figure, Smiley shares some of Prufox's self-consciousness when, in a scene that is powerfully played out in both the BBC and the film version, Smiley recalls his one face-to-face -face encounter with his counterpart, the Soviet spy Chief Karla. He calls himself a fool. Crucially, however, he adds that he would rather be his kind of fool than Karla's. When Smiley recounts the meeting with Karla to his younger protégé, Peter Gwillem, he reproaches himself for having talked too much on that memorable occasion in an Indian jail cell. Carla wins the encounter by never speaking, by transforming himself into the blank screen that Smiley cannot on this occasion become, which makes it all the easier for Smiley to fall into the trap of projecting his own anxieties and preoccupations onto the impassive Carla. In the novel, Smiley affects to disdain the psychoanalytic language of projection, but tellingly, he cannot resist using these terms to describe himself, appropriately, for in the normal run of things, Smiley's art consists in cultivating a particular kind of silence, not the mere absence of chatter, but the authoritative, probing silence of the psychoanalyst. The face can't give anything away, yet at the same time it has to invite confidence. Those who don't want to talk must be drawn into confiding. And isn't that a large part of Smiley's appeal to those of us from a more adolescent, more compulsively loquacious time? his grown-up capacity to engender respect and to quietly solicit our need for his approval. 
Speaking after a London critics screening of Tinker Tailor in September, Oldman said that, by contrast with the Guinness version, no one would want to hug his smiley. Yet the suggestion that we would want to hug Guinness's smiley is absurd. Surely what we find ourselves craving from smiley is a word, a gesture, the merest hint of approbation. But it is a mistake to see the avuncular seductions of Guinness's performance as if they were in opposition to the ruthlessness which Oldman emphasises in his rendition of Smiley. For Smiley's merciless, unblinking hunting down of his prey depends upon this very capacity to draw people out. Oldman's reading of Smiley's blankness is far less sophisticated than Guinness's. Le Carre's Smiley is famously corpulent. Oldman's is angular, stiff, dyspeptic. We can't imagine ever wanting to confide in him. Oldman Smiley is simply an inexpressive mask, forbidding, impassive, unyielding. It is as if Oldman is giving us his shallow reading of his grandparents' generation, aloof, distant, bottled up. They kept it all inside. They didn't know how to have a good time. For Oldman, Smiley's restraint plays as repression and a certain malicious self-satisfaction. His silence is a simple lack of demonstrativeness, or a merely inversive demonstrativeness. Speaking on BBC Radio 4's Today, Le Carre himself identified Oldman's performance of repression as one of the highlights of this new version. You couldn't really imagine Alec Guinness having a sex life, he said. You couldn't imagine a kiss on the screen with Alec, not one that you believed in. Whereas Oldman has quite obviously a male sexuality that he represses, like all his other feelings in the story. Oldman is a smiley waiting patiently to explode. I think the air of frustration, of solitude that he is able to convey, is something that really does take me back to a novel I wrote 37 years ago. Sadly, this remark suggests less a new way of seeing Smiley than a certain coarsening of understanding brought about no doubt by the decimation of a therapeutic wisdom which insists that the truth of a character is to be found in their narrowly defined sexuality. To say that Smiley is waiting patiently to explode is a very curious take on a character defined rather by a lack of heat. When Oldman shouts at Hayden, What are you then, Bill? at the climax of the film, this is an abandonment of emotional decorum quite out of keeping with Smiley's character, for whom the English ruling class habit of transposing aggression into the chill of superficially polite discourse comes as second nature. Anger is one of the emotions that the Smiley of the novel feels at the moment of Hayden's exposure, yet it is not the dominant one. Smiley saw with painful clarity an ambitious man born to the big canvas, brought up to rule, divide and conquer, whose vision and vanities were all fixed, like Percy's, upon the world's game, for whom the reality was a poor island with scarcely a voice that would carry across the water. Thus Smiley felt not only disgust, but, despite all the moment meant to him, a sense of resentment against the institutions he was supposed to be protecting. Thus, the tone of triumphalism with which the film ends, Smiley gloriously restored to his place of honour in MI6, strikes another false note. The Smiley in Alfredson's film is a figure who is far less queer than the Smiley of the novel or the television series. Homosexual desire is widespread in Tinker Tailor, most notably in Prido's betrayed love for the flamboyantly polysexual Hayden, but there is no suggestion that Smiley shared these passions. The Smiley of the novel and series is queer in the more radical sense that a normal sexuality cannot be assigned to him. Smiley's is not a fluid, indeterminate sexuality like, say, that of Patricia Highsmith's Tom Ripley. His perversity is renunciation itself. At the preview, Oldman referred approvingly to Le Carre's comments on Guinness's lack of sexuality, but he also characterised Smiley as masochistic, repeatedly subjecting himself to adulterous humiliations, and sadistic, the way he pursues his prey goes far beyond professional duty. Yet the idea that Smiley is sadomasochistic quite clearly contradicts the idea that he is repressed. For sadomasochism entails enjoyment, not repression. Far from being repressed, it is clear that Smiley is driven, driven by something which will not allow him to ever recline into happy retirement any more than he could settle into the pleasures of conjugal life, were they available to him. From his earliest appearances in Le Carre's fiction, in the novels Call for the Dead and A Murder of Quality, Smiley is on the edge of things. 
In most of the novels which feature Smiley, he rarely appears as officially a member of MI6. He is called out of retirement or pretending to be retired, and when, after Tinker Taylor, he is not only restored to the organisation but made chief, it is in a temporary caretaker capacity. One of the paradoxes of Smiley's character is that he seems to stand for the solidity and stolidity ascribed to a certain model of Englishness, yet he is himself an outsider, an interloper, a voyeur. This is the spy's vocation, and Le Carre repeatedly insists on it, nowhere more passionately than in the bitter outburst of the agent Alec Lemass at the end of The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, so memorably performed by Richard Burton in the 1965 film adaptation. What do you think spies are? Moral philosophers measuring everything they do against the word of God or Karl Marx? They're not, they're just a bunch of seedy, squalid bastards like me. Burton's Lamas tells his lover Liz after it has been revealed that they were pawns in a complex plot hatched by Control and Smiley. It is the beyond good and evil agent, the one who acts without performing complex moral calculations, the one who cannot belong to the normal world, who allows ordinary folk to sleep easily. Yet duty is only the pretext. There is also the matter of the deep libidinal lure of this no man's land for outsiders like Lamas and Smiley. Like writers, they listen and observe. Like actors, they play parts. But for spies, there are no limits to these roles. One cannot simply step out of them and return to the warm, because everything, including inner life itself, all its wounds and private shames, starts to feel like a cover, a series of props. There is a revelatory passage towards the end of the second Smiley novel, A Murder of Quality, first published in 1962. At the end of the novel, a strange whodunit thriller, Smiley confronts the murderer, but in the later confrontation with Carla, he ends up talking about himself. And there are some of us, aren't there, who are nothing, who are so labile that we astound ourselves. We're the chameleons. I read a story once about a poet who bathed himself in cold fountains so that he could recognise his own existence in the contrast of it. The people like that, they can't feel anything inside them. No pleasure, no pain, no love or hate. They have to feel that cold water. Without it, they're nothing. The world sees them as showmen, fantasists, liars, as sensualists, perhaps. Not for what they are, the living dead. There is a clear implication in this slide from first person, some of us, to third person, people like that. The cold warrior Smiley is himself one of the living dead. In psychoanalytic terms, Smiley is less a sadomasochist than an obsessional neurotic. Lacan, in fact, argues that the question posed by the obsessional is, am I alive or am I dead? At the end of Smiley's People, when Smiley has defeated Carla and has the possibility of winning Anne back, Smiley is very far from being elated. There is little sense of this in Oldman Smiley. His sadomasochism is too crude to approximate the baroque mechanisms of self-deceptions and self-torturings which govern Smiley's psyche. Yet another false note is struck in Alfredson's film, when Smiley sees Anne being embraced by Hayden at the MI5 Christmas party. He throws himself against the wall in a spasm of agony. In other respects, the party scene adds something which wasn't there in the BBC version, a sense of the camaraderie within the department. But it is hard to imagine Smiley engaging in so public and so spontaneous a display of emotion. More troublingly, to suggest that Smiley would straightforwardly feel pain when confronted with Anne's infidelities is to betray the very idea that he is masochistic. When confronted about Anne in the novel and TV adaptation, Smiley's preferred pose is one of weary resignation, but this conceals the secret satisfaction that he experiences in Anne playing her assigned role as impossible object. But where the masochist would organise his enjoyment around this impossible object, for Smiley, the function of Anne's unattainability is to keep her at a safe distance. His enjoyment is not organised around Anne, or sexuality, at all, and when she is safely unattainable, she cannot trouble him. Unlike in the TV series, we never see the faces of either Anne or Carla, Smiley's other other in the film. This rightly suggests that both figures are at least partially absent for Smiley, filled in with his fantasies. 
But what's missing is an account of the way that Smiley fills in these fantasy screens and any sense of discrepancy between the fantasy figures that Smiley projects and their real life counterparts. In the film, Smiley cannot remember what Carla looked like. In the novel, he gives a detailed description of his adversary. Defined externally by his struggle against Carla, Smiley's internal struggle consists of his necessarily thwarted attempts to refute any identification with his Soviet counterpart. Smiley's attempts to distance himself from the fanatic Carla, his attempts to position himself outside of politics itself, are the exemplary gestures of a very English ideology, which appeals to a pre- or post-political notion of common humanity. Yet ironically, what Smiley and Carla have in common is their inhumanity, their exile from any sort of normal world of human passions. When they meet in Delhi, Smiley is baffled, frustrated, but also fascinated by Carla's refusal of the appeal, unable to fathom a commitment to an abstract ideology, especially when, in Smiley's view, it has self-evidently failed. The irony in Lacara's fiction, writes Tony Barley, is that a sound basis for commitment is always either sought or mourned for its absence. And yet when genuine commitment appears, invariably in communism, it is treated as incomprehensible. Communism becomes fanaticism, not a strength but a weakness. Barley rightly argues that Smiley cannot be read as a cipher for liberal ideology because the incoherences and impasses of his own position are never resolved. Behind the manifest content of Smiley's entreaties to Carla, come and join us, give up your dead generalities, enjoy the particularities of the lived world. The latent message is that all Britain has to offer is disillusionment, the impossibility of belief. Smiley tells Gwilam that fanaticism will be the undoing of Carla. In fact, when Carla is defeated in Smiley's people, it is because of his failure to be sufficiently fanatical. Very little of this comes out in Alfredson's depoliticised film, in which Smiley is simply a wronged hero who ultimately attains justice, Hayden is simply a traitor, and communism is simply an exotic period reference. The nickname for MI6, The Circus, in fact openly acknowledges the aberrant enjoyment available to those who have crossed into this fictional cold world. The multivalent origin of the nickname, in addition to hinting at the way the spies play their deadly game in a spirit of mordant, laconic cynicism, it is also a near hominem of service and a play on the location in the novel of MI6's offices, Cambridge Circus, Central London, tells you a great deal about the world in which Smiley operates. Much of the power of the television version derived from the way it threw us directly into this world. Guinness's Smiley incarnated a model of BBC paternalism. He guided us through his world, but he had high expectations of us. Very little was explained. We had to pick up Le Carre's invented nomenclature, scalfunters, lamplighters, on the fly. The work slang invoked the exoticism of a rarefied form of labour, while also suggesting the routinization of espionage for those involved in it on a daily basis. It all contributed to the feeling that circus was a lived-in world. One of the major problems with Alfredson's Tinker Tailor, by contrast, is that its world doesn't feel lived-in at all. Gratifyingly, the film does not talk down to audiences. Just as in the TV series, we are required to orientate ourselves in the circus's intrigues. But the combination of Oldman's inexpressiveness and the compression brought about by having to tell so complicated a story in such a short time results in something that is strangely uninvolving. The film is almost entirely lacking in tension or paranoia. In the TV series, the scene where Galam steals a file from the circus is almost unbearably tense. In the film, the same scene plays out in a curiously distanced way. Then there is the question of period, and the film striving to create a sense of London in the 70s. I was too often reminded of Life on Mars, which evoked the decade with a series of clumsily placed period signifiers. As with Life on Mars, much of Anderson's film looks like a 70s theme park. Rather than discreetly constituting a period background, branded goods, Trevor Mintz, Ajax Household Cleaner, are distractingly pushed to the foreground of our attention, details that we are invited to approvingly note. But where the details matter, this new version is lacking. Eras produce certain voices, certain faces. 
What's missing in Alfredson's version is something like the grain of the 70s. Too often, the actors seem like 21st century moisturised metrosexuals in 70s drag, and bad drag at that. Presented with photographs of people from the 70s, the cliched but accurate observation is that people look so much older then. But the preposterously fresh-faced likes of Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays Galam, and Tom Hardy in the role of rogue agent Ricky Tarr, aren't nearly weathered enough to convince us 70s secret agents. The skin, the hair, are too good. The faces are without the sallow, harrowed, harried look that Michael Jaston and Highwell Bennett brought to the roles in the 70s production. Their voices are unable to convey any sense of the bitter and brutalising effects of the spy's life. John Hurt's control, at least, has the right weather-beaten complexion and the cynical, playful cadences. Accents are a severe problem in the film. Oldman plays Smiley as generically posh, but at the same time he sounds like no one you've ever heard. At points, there's an oddly Scottish lilt to his accent. The accent of Toby Jones's Percy Alleline, meanwhile, played as Scottish in keeping with the novel, keeps drifting southward. Kathy Burke is hopelessly miscast as Connie Sachs. She sounds like a schoolgirl taking on the part of a posh woman in the school play. The problem here isn't just one of authenticity, it's that the wayward accents once again undermine the sense of a lived-in world. There is too much conspicuous effort going on in this 70s simulation. Throughout, you can practically hear Gary Oldman straining to hold back the estuary English. In the BBC version, the circus was an unprepossessing space. Functional dreary corridors leading into cramped offices. In Alfredson's version, Control's office looks more like something from a nightclub than what you would expect to see in MI6. No one wants to escape the 70s version, but Alfredson doesn't give us nearly enough to do that. There is much that is different, but nothing that is strong enough to displace the television version in the memory. The casting of Colin Firth as Hayden, however, at least allows us to see the character in a different way. The face of Ian Richardson, who would go on to play the Tory grandee and Machiavelle in the BBC television series House of Cards, provided a grey eminence image of British power in the 70s and 80s. I don't know who it was who said that Colin Firth looks like the midway point between the current British Prime Minister David Cameron and his deputy Nick Clegg, but the observation is very astute. The face of the British establishment no longer has the hawk-like puckishness of Richardson. It has the rumpled, casual youthfulness of Firth. One of the major problems with Alfredson's film is that it assumes the ruling values of the neoliberal world governed by youth and consumerism. Isn't this what American codes for in the Smiley novels? Richard Sennett has argued that the chronic short-termism of neoliberal culture has resulted in a corrosion of character, a destruction of permanence, loyalty and the capacity to plan. Isn't Smiley's allure tied up with the possibilities of character itself? In the 70s, Smiley showed up all the inadequacies, squalid compromises and subterranean brutalities of social democracy. Then, Smiley's doubts and his failings prompted us to imagine a better world, even as we struggled to resist Smiley's blankly and perversely comforting avuncularity. Now, when that better world seems if anything further away, it takes all our effort to resist the lure of nostalgia for the social democratic world of which Smiley was both the conscience and the dirty secret. The past is an alien planet. The first and last episodes of Life on Mars. K-Punk Post, January 10th, 2006. Life on Mars is symptomatic enough to be interesting. Symptomatic of what? Well, of a culture that has lost confidence not just that the future will be good, but that any sort of future is possible. And also, Life on Mars suggests that one of the chief resources of recent British culture, the past, is reaching the point of exhaustion. The scenario is that Sam Tyler, John Sim, a detective from 2006, is hit by a car and finds himself back in 1973. The game that you can't help playing as you watch is, how convincing is the simulation of 1973? You're constantly on the lookout for period anachronisms. The answer is that it isn't very convincing. 
but not because of anachronisms. The problem is that this is a 73 that doesn't feel lived in. The actual post-psychedelic quasi-Eastern Bloc seediness of the 70s is unretrievable. Kitsch wallpaper and bell bottoms are transformed instantly into style quotations the moment the camera falls upon them. There must be some technical reason. Maybe it's the film stock they used that accounts for why British TV is no longer capable of rendering any sense of a lived-in world. No matter what is filmed, everything always looks like it's been thickly, slickly painted in gloss, like it's all a corporate video. That remains my problem with the new Doctor Who as it happens. The contemporary British scenes look like a theme park, a very stagey, stage set, too well lit. Look out, there's a thief about public information films on black and white TV, open university lectures with preposterous moustaches and voluminous collars, the test card. Everything is so iconic, and the thing with icons, after all, is that they evoke nothing. The icon is the very opposite of the Madeline, Chris Marker's name, rhyming Hitchcock and Proust, for those totemic triggers that suddenly abduct you into the past. The point being that the Madeline can only manage this time-snatching function because it has avoided museumification and memorialization, stayed out of the photographs, been forgotten in a corner. Hearing T-Rex now doesn't remind you of 73, it reminds you of nostalgia programmes about 1973. And isn't part of our problem that every cultural object from 1963 on has been so thoroughly, forensically mulled over that nothing can any longer transport us back? A problem of digital memory. Baudrillard observes somewhere that computers don't really remember because they lack the ability to forget. K-Punk Post, April 13th, 2007 in the end, the science fiction elements of life on Mars consisted solely in an ontological hesitation. Is this real or not? As such, life on Mars fell squarely into Todorov's definition of the fantastic as that which hesitates between the uncanny, that which can ultimately be explained naturalistically, and the marvellous, that which can only be accounted for in supernatural terms. The predicament that Life on Mars explored was, is Sam Tyler in a coma and the whole 70s world in which he is lost some kind of unconscious confabulation? Or has he, by some means not yet understood, been transported back into the real 1973? The show maintained the equivocation until the end. The final episode was ambivalent to the point of being cryptic. Sim has wryly observed that the show's central conceit lets the production off the hook. If Tyler was in a coma, then any of Life on Mars's historical inaccuracies could be explained away as the gaps in the characters' recollections of the period. No doubt the enjoyment of Life on Mars derived from its imperfect recollection not of 1973 itself, but of the television of the 70s. The programme was mitigated nostalgia. I love 1973 as a cop show. I say cop show because it is clear that the SF elements of Life on Mars were little more than pretexts. The show was a meta cop show rather than meta SF. The time travel conceit permitted the showing of representations which would otherwise be unacceptable, and beneath the framing ontological question, is this real or not, there was a question about desire and politics, do we want this to be real? As the avatar of the present, Sam Tyler became the bad conscience of the 70s cop show, whose discontent with the past permitted us to enjoy it again. Sim, as the modern enlightened good cop, was less the antitype of antediluvian bad cop Gene Hunt than the postmodern disavowal which made possible our enjoyment of Hunt's invective and violence. Hunt, played by Philip Glenister, became the show's real star, beloved of the tabloids who adored quoting his streams of abuse, carefully constructed by the writers so that they could come across as comic rather than inflammatory. Hunt's no-nonsense policing was presented with enough grit to make us wince, but never so much violence that it would invoke disgust. In this respect, the programme was the cultural equivalent of a blow to a suspect that would not show up under later medical examination. Undoubtedly, although perhaps unintentionally, the show's ultimate message was reactionary. In the end, rather than Tyler educating Hunt, it was he would come to accommodation with Hunt's methods. 
When in the final episode, Tyler is faced with a choice between betraying Hunt or staying loyal, at this point in the narrative, it appears that Tyler's betrayal of Hunt is the requisite price Tyler must pay in order to return to 2007. This also became a choice between 1973 and the present day that amounted to a decision, not about the collar lengths or the cultural preferences, but about policing styles. Audience sympathy is managed such that, however much we disapprove of Hunt, we are never supposed to lose faith in him, so that Tyler's betrayal seemed far worse than any of Hunt's many misdemeanours. Tyler's apparent return to 2007 underscores this by presenting the modern environment as sterile, drearily worthy, ultimately far less real than the rough justice of Hunt's era. Modern wisdom, how can you maintain the law by breaking the law, is set against Hunt's renegade heroic identification of himself with the law. I am the law, so how can I break it? The deep libidinal appeal of Hunt derives from his impossible duality as upholder of the law and he who enjoys unlimited jouissance. The two faces of the father, the stern lawgiver and pure jouissance, resolved. The perfect figure of reactionary longing, a charismatic embodiment of everything allegedly forbidden to us by political correctness. Can the world be as sad as it seems? David Peace and his adapters. David Peace's four red riding novels were acts of exorcism and evacuation of the near past. A bloody riposte to I Love the 70s clip show nostalgia. They stalk the West Yorkshire that Peace grew up in, transforming real events, the framing and intimidation of Stefan Kisko, the incompetent police operation to catch the Yorkshire Ripper, into background for brutal and unrelenting fictions that possess an apocalyptic lyricism. Peace has always been dogged by comparisons with James Elroy. There's no doubt that encountering Elroy liberated something in Peace, but in the end, Peace is the better writer. Peace has called the experience of reading Elroy's White Jazz his Sex Pistols moment. But Peace builds upon what Elroy achieved, much in the way that the post-punk groups leapt into the space that the Pistols had blown open. Peace extrapolates a pulp modernist poetics from Elroy's experiments in telegraphic compression. And while Elroy's pugilistic prose has a pump-action amphetamine drive, Peace's writing is hypnotic and oneric. It's incantatory repetitions delaying and veiling plot revelations rather than rushing headlong towards resolution. Despite presenting seemingly similar worlds, in which the police are routinely corrupt, journalists are venal and co-optable, and the wealthy are vampiric exploiters, their political orientations are very different. Elroy is a Hobbesian conservative, who evinces a macho pragmatism that accepts violence, exploitation and betrayal as inevitable. The same phenomena are oppressively omnipresent in Peace's world, but there is no sense of acceptance. Instead, his novels read like howls of agony and calls for retribution, divine or otherwise. Peace, who has said that he aimed to produce a crime fiction which is no longer entertainment, has written crime works that are hauntological in a triple sense. The crime genre is of course well suited to explore the moral, existential and theological problems posed by what Quentin Malisieu called odious deaths. The deaths of those who have met their end prematurely, whose death is not the proper conclusion of a life but its violent curtailment. And as they moved away from the uneasy combination of fanciful genre trappings, period signifiers, angry young man homage and brutality that characterised 1974, the novels of the Red Riding Quartet were simultaneously drawn towards actuality and theology, as if the proximity of the one entailed the other. Readers are put into the position of spectral mourners by the voices of those who have died odiously. The Ripper's victims, heard in the visionary Transmissions, which preface each of the chapters in 1980, sections which combine the actual, gleaned from reportage and biography, with the spectral. The novels are hauntological in another sense, a sense that is closer to the way in which we have used it in relation to music, but not quite the same. Peace is not at all interested in the problems of degraded memory which preoccupy the caretaker, burial or Basinski. He is a past without crackle, rendered in the first person and in a tense that is very nearly present. The occlusions in the narrative are due not to faulty recording devices or memory disorders, cultural or personal, but to the self-blindings of his characters who see themselves, and the events of which they are part, only through a glass darkly. 
In the end, everything, narrative, intelligibility, succumbs to total murk as the characters begin to dissociate. It becomes difficult to know what is happening or what has happened. At a certain point, it is unclear as to whether we have crossed over into the land of the dead. Hunter, the senior Manchester detective assigned to investigate the West Yorkshire police force in 1980, finds himself caught up in a world in which things don't add up, they don't fit together. It's a Gnostic terrain. The Gnostics thought that the world was made up of a corrupt matter characterised by heavy weight and impenetrable opacity. A murky, muddy mire in which fallen angels, one of the persistent images in the Red Riding books, are trapped. There is no question of Hunter or solicitor John Piggott in 1983, or even Peace, being able to completely illuminate what has happened. This is a world in which, as Tony Grassoni, the screenwriter who adapted the novels for Channel 4, puts it, narratives disappear into the dark. The libidinal orientation towards the past is also markedly different in the case of Peace and Sonic Hauntology. Whereas hauntological music has emphasised the unexplored potentials prematurely curtailed in the periods it invokes, Peace's novels are driven by the unexpiated suffering of Yorkshire at the end of the 70s. And Peace's writing is also hauntological in its intuition that particular places are stained by particular occurrences, and vice versa. As he has insisted in many interviews, it is no accident that Sutcliffe was the Yorkshire Ripper. Peace's books are avowedly anti-nostalgic, the anti-life on Mars, with its ambivalence towards police brutality and its media representation. There is no such vindication in Peace's novels, no suppressed yearning for a time in which coppers could beat suspects with impunity. After all, it is corruption rather than criminality per se that is the focus of the Red Riding Quartet. Music in Peace's books functions as a hauntological trigger. He's remarked that he uses music, including music he doesn't like, to take him back to the feel, the grain of a period. Musical references are embedded in the text either diegetically as background sound or more esoterically as cryptic epigraphic ciphers and repeated incantations, a portal effect that gratifyingly echoes, in reverse, the way in which the music of the 70s, especially post-punk, would direct listeners to fiction. 1980 is haunted in particular by throbbing gristle, especially the phrase that they took from another killer, Charles Manson. Can the world be as sad as it seems? In Peace's hands, this question becomes an urgent theological inquiry, the very relentlessness of the sadness and misery he recounts calling forth an absent God, a God who is experienced as absent, the great light eclipsed by the world's unending tears. The world, the sad, desolated world, is full of angels whose wings have either been shorn off, reduced to stubble, or which have grown into gigantic, dirty monstrosities. Addict angels hooked on alcohol, casual but incessant lusts, and the trash of the consumer society that is struggling to be born out of the wreckage of the social democratic consensus. Angels whose ultimate response to the world is puking. Everyone pukes in pieces novels throwing up the whiskies and the undercooked crispy pancakes, but never being able to purge any of it, never being able to take flight. The religious elements in the books become increasingly foregrounded as the quartet develops, until the deeply ambiguous hallucinatory ending of 1983 becomes a quasi-Gnostic treatise on evil and suffering. The final section of the novel, Total Eclipse of the Heart, that transfiguration of pop cultural reference into epigraph being one of Peace's signature techniques, explicitly posits the idea that, far from undermining the existence of God, evil and suffering entail that God must exist. Eclipse implies something that is eclipsed, a hidden source of light that produces all this shadow. In the philosophy of religion, the problem of evil maintains that suffering, particularly suffering visited upon the innocent, means that the theistic God could not exist, since a benevolent, omnipotent and omniscient being would not countenance undeserved suffering. With his inventory of wretched child abuse cases, Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov makes the most famous and most passionate statement of this position. Yet if there is no God, the suffering remains, only now there is no possibility of its expiation. If there can be no justice to come, the universe is permanently blighted, irrevocably scarred by atrocity, abuse and torture. The Red Riding novels inspired Channel 4 into making the kind of television dramas that some of us had long since ceased hoping could ever be made in Britain again.
The three films, broadcast in 2009, were the most striking British dramas of the first decade of the 21st century, towering above all the facile costume epics, routine police procedurals and emotional pornography which clogged the schedules. Moreover, in their use of setting and landscape, in the epiphantic power of their images, the Red Riding films attained a visual poetry and an expressionist naturalism that exceeded practically anything British cinema has achieved in the past 30 years. As Nick James observed in his preview of the Red Riding films for Sight and Sound, nothing in the previous career of the Red Riding's three directors, Julian Jarrod for 1974, James Marsh for 1980 and Anad Tucker for 1983 gave any hints that they could produce work of this quality. In many ways, it is as if the auteur of these films was Peace himself, and the three directors succeed so consummately because they allowed themselves to be channels of his infernal vision. It was inevitable that some compression occurred in the transition from page to screen. Indeed, one whole novel from Peace's Red Riding sequence, 1977, was never filmed. But Tony Grossoni deserves immense credit for the way that he weaved the three films into a symphonic coherence that nevertheless refused easy closure and intelligibility. Peace's equivalent of Elroy's anti-hero Dudley Smith, the corrupt detective who justifies his own running of drugs and vice operations as containment, is Maurice Johnson the way-faced policeman who features in all three of the films. Where Smith, as masterfully played by James Cromwell in the best Elroy adaptation to date, L.A. Confidential, is charming, charismatic and flamboyantly loquacious, Jobson, as played by David Morrissey in the C4 adaptations, is taciturn, abstracted, immobile, blank, in a semi fagu state of disassociation from the atrocities he participates in. Morrissey's is one of many excellent performances in the trilogy, all of them masters of measure and controlled power, proper television film acting, far from the braying thespery that the British theatrical tradition often turns out. Rebecca Hall is damaged and dangerous as Paula Garland, Maxine Peake angular yet vulnerable as Helen Marshall. Sean Harris manages to make Robert Craven plausibly loathsome without tripping over into grand Gugnal grotesquerie, while Paddy Considine brings a flinty resolution to the role of Peter Hunter, one of the few lightbringers in the Red Riding's North, an invented world in which evil enjoys carnivalesque license and the police and the powerful are free to do what they want. The film adaptation of Peace's extraordinary novel, The Damned United, lived down to expectations to just about the same extent that the Channel 4 films exceeded them. The team tasked with adapting the novel looked unpromising. Director Tom Hooper, drafted in after Stephen Frears left the project, had a background in fairly unremarkable television. He would later go on to make The King's Speech. While the shtick of screenwriter Peter Morgan and lead actor Michael Sheen, as established in The Queen and Frost Nixon, didn't have any obvious fit with Peace's fractured and abrasive modernism. In the end, Hooper and Morgan didn't adapt Pierce, they eliminated him. Hooper's film returns us to the found object narrative. Brian Clough's bitter 44-day stint as manager of Leeds United in 1974 that Peace used as a raw material for his fiction based on fact. What's missing is everything that Peace brought to the facts. The bite of a reel that will always elude bourgeois realism and the shaping power of a Gnostic mythography in which the most malign entity is the cursed land of Yorkshire itself. It can be tiresome to criticise a film adaptation simply for the ways it differs from its source novel. In this case, however, a close comparison of the two versions of The Damned United is instructive for two reasons. First, because in Erasing Peace's signature, the film in effect competes with his rendition of the Clough Leeds story. And second, because Peace's pulp modernism precisely offers British culture an escape from the kind of good-humoured, well-balanced, middle-of-the-road, middle-brow realism that Hooper and Morgan trade in. At the press screening, Morgan said that when he read The Damned United, it brought a nostalgia rush, like eating Farley's rusks. Yet surely even the most guileless of the readers of Peace's novel could see that it tastes not of the warm mush of baby food, but of bile scotch and reflux stomach acid. In Hooper and Morgan's hands, Clough's story is reduced to all the givens, all the off-the-shelf narratives and thematic pegs, 
He was a misunderstood genius, struggling against an establishment represented by puffed-up provincial patriarchs like the Derby County Chairman Sam Longson, well played by Jim Broadbent. He was self-destructive, and he needed his partner Peter Taylor, Timothy Spall, to curb his excesses. He was locked into an Oedipal struggle with the man he replaced at Leeds, Don Reavy. Even this is told more than it is shown, and throughout the audience treat it as if it is witless. Dialogue is too often used for clumsy plot exposition or to crudely telegraph themes. Not only do Hooper and Morgan fail to evoke Peace's existential terrain, his blighted vision of Yorkshire, they also convey little of his intense sense of territoriality. In the novel, Leeds's Elland Road ground is the site of a struggle over space in which Clough is up against both the spectre of Don Reavy and the animal aggression of the players he has left behind. A striking image from the novel of Clough chopping up and burning Reavy's desk in an attempt to exercise the absent father ghost inexplicitly never made it to the screen. The film also misses the purgatorial rhythm of sport which Peace caught so acutely. As every sports fan, never mind about coach, knows, the jouissance of sport is essentially masochistic. The Damned United shows what Clock's tragedy was, Chris Petit put in his review of the novel. Deep down, he knew that winning was only loss deferred. The intense fear that colours everything in Peace's novel is dissolved in a tone that is frequently jaunty. Then there is Michael Sheen. The problem with Sheen's now well-established approach to historical characters is that it deprives the film's world of any autonomous reality. Everything is indexed to a reality external to the film, judged only by how well it matches our already existing images of the character, whether that be Clough, Kenneth Williams, Blair or Frost. And there are bizarre bleed-throughs between the characters. At one point it felt as if Sheen's campy Clough had morphed into Kenneth Williams. Certainly, Peace has an advantage over the filmmakers here. Written fiction can move beyond received television images of figures from recent history far more quickly than film can, but an actor with more courage and presence than Sheen might have reached beyond physical appearances to reach a truth of cloth not accessible via TV footage. Instead, Sheen offers his usual tracing of mannerisms and verbal tics, competent enough as far as it goes, but devoid of any of the tortured inner life that Peace gave to his cloth. Even if the acting were uniformly superb, it would have needed far more than Hooper provides in order to summon the dread and misery of Peace's world. But the indifferent photography and often appalling soundtrack make Hooper's The Damned United feel more like a dramatisation of actual events than a film of Peace's novel. Now Then, Now Then, Jimmy Saville and the 70s on Trial, from July 2013. The turn that events took had all the look of some kind of ritual assassination. The killing not of a body, the body was already dead, but of a name. It was as if some kind of deal had been struck. You'll get to live out your life with your reputation intact, or as intact as it could be, but a year after your death, it will all be destroyed. Nothing, absolutely nothing, will survive. Your headstone will be dismantled. The penthouse in which you lived will be demolished. Your name will become synonymous with evil. September 2012 and it all starts to come up. Like a build-up of effluent that could no longer be contained, first seeping, then surging out. Jimmy Savile, the nation's favourite grotesque, the former DJ and children's entertainer, is exposed as a serial sex abuser and paedophile. You can't say it comes as a surprise, and that's one of the most unsettling aspects about the whole affair. How out in the open it all was. We all read the text purporting to be the transcript of an unbroadcast scene from the BBC's satirical programme Have I Got News For You, in which Savile is openly accused of being a child sex abuser and took it at face value. It seems now that the transcript was a fake, but it was an astonishingly convincing simulation. The rhythm of the interaction between the panellists, the way the verbal sparring escalates into aggression, the name of the supposed victim, Sarah Cornley, it all had a ring of authenticity, the signature of a real, perhaps, that could not then be recognised except in fiction. Yes, in a certain way it was all out in the open. We all knew, or felt that we knew, but it mattered that the abuse was never acknowledged in his lifetime. For while the story remained unofficial, Savile would not only go unpunished, he could continue to comport himself as a celebrated entertainer, a knight of the realm, stalwart charity fundraiser. 
No doubt Savile took a sociopathic delight in being able to get away with it in plain sight. In his 1974 autobiography, As It Happens, Savile had boasted about having sex with an underage runaway. The police wouldn't dare touch him, he taunted. Neither, it seemed, would the media. Occasionally, a journalist would attempt to breach his defences. Louis Thoreau did his trademark gentle probing of Savile about the paedophilia allegations in a 2000 BBC documentary, but of course there was no question of the old man cracking. By the end of 2012, the 70s was returning, no longer as some bittersweet nostalgia trip, but as a trauma. The phrase, it's like something out of David Peace, has become something of a commonplace in the past few years. Strangely for fiction that is about the past, Peace's work has actually gained in prophetic power since its publication. Peace wasn't predicting the future. How could he be when he was writing about the 70s and the 80s, so much as he had fixated on those parts of the past which were about to resurface? The Fritzel case had echoes of an underground lair in which children are kept prisoner in the Red Riding novels. And everything that came to light about conspiracies among the English power elite, all the murk and tangle of Murdoch and Hillsborough, seemed to throw us back into Peace's labyrinths of corruption and cover-up. Murdoch, Hillsborough, Savile. Pull on one thread and it all started to connect, and wherever you looked there was the same grim troika. Police, politicians, media. Watching each other's backs, partly for fear that they will be stabbed in their own back. Having the goods on each other, the best kind of insurance policy, the ruling class model of solidarity. After his death, Savile increasingly started to look like something peace had dreamt up. We were drawn to a certain kind of fiction because consensual reality, the common sense world that we like to think we live in, wasn't adequate to a figure like Savile. At the same time, it became clear that the elements in Peace's writing that previously seemed most melodramatically excessive were those which ended up rhyming with the new revelations. It's as if melodramatic excess is built into the real itself and the sheer implausibility of corruption and abuse itself forms a kind of cloak for the abuser. Surely this can't be happening. Savile's stomping ground was right in the heart of Peace's territory, in Leeds, where the entrepreneur DJ started to build his empire, and where, knowing that abuse is easier to get away with when it comes disguised as care, he volunteered as a hospital porter. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Incredibly, Savile was for a time a suspect in the Yorkshire Ripper investigation. Members of the public had named Savile, and the body of one of the Ripper's victims, Irene Richardson, had been found very near to his flat. Then there was the infamous photograph of Savile, Peter Sutcliffe and Frank Bruno at Broadmoor in 1991. Savile, toting his signature cigar, brokering a meeting between a serial killer and a troubled former celebrity boxer. The grinning Sutcliffe looks like he's wearing one of Savile's shell suits. The insanity of a society and of an era, all their occult complicities between celebrity, psychosis and criminality, is screamingly exposed here. Ritual inversion, light entertainment transforming into the darkest horror. By the end of 2012, Savile's name was so irretrievably sullied that his old friend Peter Sutcliffe felt he needed to speak up for him. Savile was the kind of figure who came to dominate popular culture without inspiring much affection. You couldn't say he was ever loved. Someone writing into the London Review of Books dug up the BBC's audience research reports on Savile's first appearance on Top of the Pops. 10th of December 1964. Jimmy Savile, who introduced the programme on this occasion, was obviously disliked by a large number of the sample audience. Many indicated their aversion to this artist by remarking that anything they had to say about him would be quite unprintable. Whilst comment by those who freely expressed their feelings was liberally larded with such terms as this nutcase, this obnoxious thing, and this revolting spectacle. You don't have to be loved or even liked to be a popular figure. Savile didn't even have the love-to-hate appeal of a national pantomime villain such as Simon Cowell. His ticket to fame was his grotesquerie itself. And this grotesquerie meant that one of the most initially unnerving things about the revelations was being forced to think of Savile as having any kind of sexual being. As Andrew O'Hagan argued in his piece on Savile for the London Review of Books, what mattered in the new world of television light entertainment was not likability or talent, but a certain larger-than-life aura. Call it eccentricity or call it derangement which Savile easily possessed as his birthright. 
Even those who found Savile creepy could accept that he belonged on television. After all, where else could he possibly belong? The problem was that after the 60s, if you belonged on television, there was nowhere that wasn't open to you. We now know that Savile was given the keys to the Broadmoor Hospital for the Criminally Insane so that he could wander around the institution, just one example of the freedoms that Savile's celebrity and power would acquire for him. We hear that Savile molested parapleptic patients in their hospital beds, and I'm reminded of Dennis Potter's 1976 television play Brimstone and Treacle, in which the lead character, the unctuous Martin, rapes a severely brain-damaged young woman while pretending to care for her. The BBC withdrew the play just before it was due to be broadcast, presumably at around the same time that Savile was appearing on Saturday night's kids' TV while raping helpless patients in private. As Savile's reputation descended into the mire, it pulled others with it. The police investigation prompted by the scandal, Operation Yew Tree, went after a whole slew of former household names, with surely more to come. Someone, I don't remember who, says it's like the 70s have gone on trial. Yes, but it's a very particular strand of the 70s that is under investigation. Not the officially rebotched rock and roll 70s, not Led Zeppelin or Sabbath, but the family entertainment 70s. As the stories mounted up, Savile came to seem more and more unbelievable. Taken together, even facts that were already known about Savile before his death came to look as if they couldn't possibly be true. Could it really be the case, for instance, that Savile had taken part in negotiations between the Israeli and the Egyptian governments in the 70s? That he had mediated between Prince Charles and Princess Diana as their marriage started to fail? And how mad, how desperate would you have to be to take Jimmy Savile's advice on your marriage? That he had spent Christmas after Christmas with Margaret Thatcher? Thatcher had tried four times to ennoble Savile, but was repeatedly rebuffed by her advisers and only succeeded in knighting him at the fag end of her period as Prime Minister. Murdoch and the Daily Mail wasted no time in pushing the idea that the abuse was an institutional pathology. It was the BBC, and more broadly, the paternalistic media culture of the 60s and 70s which had incubated Savile's corruption. The BBC, now in a permanent state of confusion about its role in a neoliberal world, duly went into a neurotic, narcissistic collapse. Its judgement was shot. It had failed to broadcast a report about Savile's abuse, and the crisis over Savile would push it into moving too hastily when, a few months later, a Tory peer was wrongly named in another abuse scandal. Murdoch and the Mail crowed on about how the Savile revelations demonstrated the importance of press freedom. But the question that they neatly evaded was, where were their brave hacks? Why didn't they expose Savile when it mattered, when he was alive? When the question started to be asked about how he'd got away with it, we already knew the answer. He had connections at the very top, the very top, and he took care to make friends with those in power and authority at lower levels too. Police officers regularly attended Savile's now notorious Friday morning club meetings at his home in Leeds. Savile's ascent to his unlikely position of power and influence required immense amounts of hard work. One thing you could never accuse him of was slacking. A forensically researched post on the Sump Plug blog details how infernally busy Savile was in the early days of his career. The Plaza, a ballroom in Manchester, was just one of many dance halls and clubs that Savile oversaw, managed, disc jockeyed at, wielded shadowy control over, or had some kind of undeclared stake in. Not only in Manchester, but also on the other side of the Pennines. In Bradford, in Wakefield, in Halifax, over on the coast in Scarborough and Whitby, and especially in Leeds. In his hometown, the joints he presided over included the Cat's Whiskers and the Locarno Ballroom in the County Arcade, known by locals simply as the Mecca, later rebranded as the Spinning Disc. That's where, in 1958, his predilection for underage girls first came to the attention of the police. The matter was swiftly resolved by peeling a few hundred quid off the big roll of twenties that he always carried, right up until he died. Meanwhile, in Manchester on any given night in the late 50s and early 60s, if you couldn't find Savile at the plaza at lunchtime, he'd surely be in the Ritz later on. Or if not, try the three coins in Fountain Street. He didn't even rest on Sundays. That was when he spanned the platters for upwards of 2,000 jivers and twisters at his top 10 club at Bellevue. 
The man was everywhere, at practically every major dance hall and nightclub in the North's heaving cornubations, as much of a fixture as the rotating mirror ball. Savile's empire quickly spread down south too, down to the Ilford Palais and to Decca Records, who would pay him to play their latest releases. Up north, Savile's rackets were protected by a gang of bodybuilders, boxers and wrestlers, including, improbably for those of us who came to know him as the comically fat wrestler Big Daddy, cuddly mainstay of Saturday afternoon television, Shirley Crabtree. The roots of 70s television were here, in these ballrooms and dance halls, their seediness waiting to be transubstantiated into light entertainment. But a year after Savile's death, the transubstantiation would go into extreme reverse. Now then, now then, one of Savile's catchphrases started to assume an ominous significance. Only a few months previously, the BBC had broadcast a number of programmes celebrating his life and work. Now, condemnation is not enough. All traces of his existence must be removed. Not only is the headstone taken away, but, we hear, can this possibly be true? It's impossible to tell in the fevered atmosphere that the family of a child buried near to Savile had requested that Savile's remains be disinterred, as if he were some medieval devil, a noxious cloud of malignancy that can corrupt even the dead. More farcically, CBeebies, one of the BBC's children's channels, was censured because it broadcasted a repeat of an episode of the programme The Tweenies, in which one of the characters impersonated Savile. Now then, now then. At the time when Savile was abusing, the victims were faced not with Jimmy Savile the monster, Jimmy Savile the prolific abuser of children, but with Jimmy Savile OBE, Sir Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile, Knight Commander of the Pontifical Equestrian Order of St. Gregory the Great. When we ask how Savile got away with it all, we must remember this. Naturally, fear played a part in keeping Savile's victims quiet. Who's going to believe your word against the word of a television entertainer, someone who has raised millions for charity? But we also need to take seriously the way that power can warp the experience of reality itself. Abuse by the powerful induces a cognitive dissonance in the vulnerable. This can't possibly be happening. What has happened can be pieced together only in retrospect. The powerful trade on the idea that abuse and corruption used to happen, but not anymore. Abuse and cover-up can be admitted, but only on condition that they are confined to the past. That was then, things are different now.